Hello, welcome to today's webinar on Accessibility Now. This is part three of a webinar series on accessibility. And the focus today is gonna to be on accessibility testing. Our presenter for today is Rolf Smeds. Uh, he's the product owner for the Vaden Design System. So he works on the UI components for Vaden as well as other aspects of the design system. Before we get started with the content, I just want to give a few housekeeping items for people. Uh, just to let you know, we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar as time allows. And if we can also go a little bit over if questions go long. Um, so you can put your questions as you think of them into the questions panel, which is at the lower right on the screen. There should be an icon that you can click on. Um, and if we can't answer your question immediately, as I mentioned, we will probably be taking most of these at the end. The second thing I wanted to mention is most people will ask, can we get a link to the slides? And yes, we will send that out via email within 24 hours, a link to both the slides and the recording. And then before I turn it over to Rolf, I just wanted to mention for those of you who might be new to Vaden, I wanted to just let you know who Vaden is and what we're about. So Vaden is really focused on providing frameworks that help people build and modernize Java-based applications and to do so in a way that has very productive developer experience, but also delivers a modern user experience. And we do provide two different frameworks. Our flagship framework that we're most known for is Vaden Flow, which really allows Java developers to deliver a user experience using their existing Java skill sets. We do have another framework called Hilla that is really designed for people that have typically separate front end and back end development um, and want to create a reactive front end um, and combine that with a Java back end. So that's the, the quick overview of Vaden. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rolf. Thanks, Kim. So um, like Kim just mentioned, this is the third part of our Accessibility Now series. Uh, the first two parts were about um, accessibility standards and accessibility laws, in, especially in the US and the EU. And the second part was about, about uh, how to build uh, accessible web applications with Vaden. So I'm going to start this webinar with a really quick recap of the most important parts of part uh, of, uh, of parts one and two. Then we're going to be looking at how to test colors and color contrast, especially. Uh, and I'll show you something known as the access accessibility tree and how you can access that in different browsers. Next, we're going to be looking at some automated uh, accessibility testing tools. And finally, we're going to look at how, what it is like to test a web UI with a screen reader. And at the end, we'll hopefully have some time for a Q&A, and you'll get links to the previous two webinars. So before we start uh, with the recap, I want to mention that I don't really consider myself to be an accessibility expert. I've worked. Uh, a lot with accessibility in the past couple of years as we have made, I think, pretty great efforts in improving accessibility in the body components. So during the past couple of years, I've learned a lot myself and uh, the learnings uh, that I've made are what I'm, I've been sharing in, in these webinars. And that is what, what I'm going to do today as well. So let's start with that recap. First of all, the US and EU accessibility laws are all based on a standard known as WCAG 2 level AA. WCAG is a technical standard for accessibility. It contains guidelines that you can use to when, when you build your UIs to ensure that they're accessible. And it contains a huge set of criteria that you can use to test the accessibility of your UI. ARIA is another standard that you probably have heard of. Uh, it consists on one hand of a set of guidelines uh, for building uh, accessible web UIs. But the most important part of ARIA are the ARIA attributes, which are HTML features for uh, improving screen reader support by 
adding additional semantics to uh, normal HTML. So there are three main aspects of accessibility that, well, there are other aspects as well, but the three main aspects that I think are the most important for you to think about in, in the web application context. Those are color contrast and colorblind friendly colors, keyboard usability for users who are unable to use a pointing device like a mouse or a trackpad, and screen reader support uh, which you need to provide by ensuring that your HTML is semantic and you can use the RE attributes for doing that. All of these things are covered in parts one and two. And if you want to know more details about that and haven't seen those, you can go and watch the recordings that we'll provide links to at the end of this webinar. So let's start with actual testing. We'll start with colors and contrast. And uh, the first thing I want to show you there is a web uh, service or web tool called WAVE, the Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. Uh, you don't even have to install anything to use it. You can just point it to, for example, botting.com, uh, which, you know, or any URL that is publicly available. And when we feed that URL into it, it will load that website into the viewport. Uh, one kind of problematic thing with Wave is that, as you can probably see, it injects its own UI into the viewport itself. So it's not a tool that lives outside of the browser viewport, like in the dev tools, for example. Instead, it inject, injects itself into the viewport itself. This is fine on a lot of websites, but for example, with the bot and app, app layout component, uh, this is problematic because the app layout is built to be the only root level uh, component on in the viewport. So if you feed a, an app layout based UI into Wave, uh, it will kind of break. Um, another annoying thing is that, as you can see here, Wave injects all of these um, markings, these annotations, these um, purple and blue and red boxes into the UI. And that can also contribute to breaking the, the layout a bit. Uh, another a third annoying thing about Wave is that in addition to flagging errors and alerts and so on, it also likes to flag all the accessibility-related features that it finds. So, for example, if we turn off these and we turn off the structural elements and the ARIA features, that will clean things up significantly. And you're left with the things that you're probably interested in, the alerts, the contrast errors, and the other errors. Now, Wave is a general accessibility testing tool, so it's, it's not just there for testing contrast, uh, and it's okay for testing accessibility stuff in general, uh, but I personally find it to be, honestly, not very good compared to another tool that we'll be looking at in a moment. So what I want to show you uh, is color contrast testing, especially specifically testing uh, the contrast between text and text background, because that's one uh, thing that I feel that Wave really excels at. So if we scroll down to this Get Started button here, we can click that one, the red uh, highlight, and we can go to the Contrast tab here. And that will show you the colors that Wave found on this button here. So there's a background color here that is a blue and a white foreground color. So the text color is a foreground. And below here, you'll see the contrast ratio, which is 3.77 to 1. That doesn't necessarily need to tell you anything unless you know the weak standard, uh, in which case you would know that that is not sufficient for this font size. So. You can also see that here, there are these two indicators here, AA and AAA. So those are two different levels of WCAG. And as I described in part one of this webinar series, uh, level AA is uh, the one that is used by the vast majority of uh, accessibility standards out there. So any laws you will find in the US or EU are based on WCAG level AA. So as you can see here, hopefully it's not too small for you to see it, uh, it says fail. So the contrast is insufficient. And the re main reason I really like using Wave for this 
is that we have these sliders here that allow you to tweak the colors live in real time on that button. So if we tweak this blue color here, you can probably see that the button changes in real time as I adjust the slider. So I can keep sliding this around. And at some point when I slide it dark enough, that fail down here will change into a pass. And that's what we want. So that way you can easily figure out how much darker you need to make either the background or the text for, uh, in order for the contrast to be as efficient. And you can even pick this color here and use it directly in your CSS uh, to replace your current color if you want to. So that's great for testing uh, the contrast between text and background specifically. That's easy to do with an automated tool like Wave because it can detect text elements and it can fairly easily uh, figure out the color of the text and the color of the background. Now, there are also other types of contrast that are relevant for uh, accessibility. So if we go into this sample app that I built for this webinar, uh, one place where we have a non-text element that still needs to be visible is the search field here. So this gray box here, the standard VOD in text field, doesn't have any text inside of it because it's an empty input field. It has an icon, but um, if you only see that icon and you don't see that gray box around it, you probably won't be able to figure out that that's actually a search field. So Wave cannot uh, determine the contrast or it cannot test the contrast of this text field against the background simply because it doesn't know that this is an element that needs to have sufficient contrast. It's unable to identify uh, the, the HTML element that has that background as a relevant element for contrast. So we will instead need to do that manually. And my favorite tool for doing that is called Color Contrast Analyzer. It's available both for Windows and Mac OS. And uh, it has these foreground and background uh, areas here. And I use these color pickers here to pick the foreground color, which is the background of the input field, and then the background color picker for the background around that field. And since we're testing non-text contrast here, you should be looking at the result here for non-text contrast for level AA of the WCAG standard, and it says fail. So what we're actually looking at here is an interactive UI element that doesn't actually by default have sufficient contrast against the background. This is actually a known issue in body and input fields uh, in that since they don't have a border by default, uh, they don't, really, don't actually have sufficient contrast against the background to pass WCAG tests. So one thing that you could do uh, to address that is to make the background darker, but, and we have the similar kind of slider here like, like we had in, in Wave, and you can use the lightness slider here to keep sliding this until you reach a sufficient, su sufficiently dark background color. But the problem is, and well, that's where we go from fail to pass. You can see it changing down here. So as you can see, we would need to make that background color significantly darker. And if we do that, the text color would, be, would not have enough contrast against the, against the background instead. So the best way to actually pass this WCAG criteria is uh, on a body and input field like this is to apply some uh, border around the field itself. And you can do that with CSS. So um, since this is an issue in the default styling of body and input fields, we are actually going to provide a high contrast or an accessible variant of the default Luma theme so that uh, you don't have to do any custom CSS tweaking yourself to, to get that done. And that will include, for example, borders around the input field and or also around uh, secondary buttons that have a similar uh, contrast issue. So that was about non-text contrast. Uh, the next thing I want to show you is 
colorblindness testing. And I switched to Firefox here because Firefox has an excellent built-in uh, colorblindness simulation tool. So the thing with colorblindness is, of course, that uh, users who have some form of colorblindness are, have trouble differentiating between certain colors because in their vision, those colors are very close to each other. So uh, Firefox has this accessibility tab here. And when you open it, there's a check for issues field here at the top. And you can select, um, oh, you can, yeah, sorry, the simulate uh, field here. And you can check, select, for example, protonopia. And as you can see, the colors in these charts here now changed to reflect uh, what these charts look like for someone with protonopia. And as we can see here, the foo and bar are pretty well distinguished from each other, but misc and buzz are fairly close to each other. Definitely not too close to be easily distinguishable though. Or we can select another type of colorblindness and we'll see that the difference is now much smaller. There's still a decent amount of brightness difference though. So it's probably okay, but you might want to consider changing those into something more easily distinguishable. And we can still change into Tritonopia and we'll see a totally different set of colors. Now there's a significant, significant change in the navigation here as well. And now MISC and Buzz are totally different colors, but instead Buzz and Foo are kind of similar. But again, there's at least some degree of uh, brightness difference between them. So that's my recommended tool for color blindness testing. There's also another tool uh, that I like to use. For example, if you don't want to use Firefox or if you want to simulate color blindness on something that is not in running in a browser window, like for example, in Sketch uh, or some other design tool, there's uh, this great tool called Color Oracle that is available both for Mac and for Windows that on Mac, it sits here in the menu bar and it allows you to simulate similar color blindness simulations uh, on the whole screen. So if I switch to this here, oh, I hope it didn't break for you or anything because I got some glitches here now because of the screen sharing. Hopefully you can see that uh, the color has now changed from the normal colors. So that's another option if, uh, if you don't or cannot use Firefox to test it. So in summary, testing colors, Wave is a pretty good tool for automated text contrast testing. If somebody knows of a better tool, I would be happy to hear that. So please let me know in the questions or in the chat. Um, Testing non-text elements pretty much has to be done manually. And I found the color contrast analyzer by TGPI to be an excellent tool for that. There's the URL for it. And then finally for color blindness simulation, my favorite is the uh, tool built into the, the Firefox accessibility tab in the dev tools. And secondly, the color Oracle tool that is available for Mac, Windows and Linux. Right, next up is something known as the accessibility tree. Um, if you watched the second part of this webinar series, uh, you know that it's very important to provide a semantic uh, HTML structure to the browser and, for, uh, and to ensure that all your UI elements that are relevant for accessibility, like any interactive element to make sure that they're semantically identified as the thing that they're supposed to be. For example, that an input field has uh, a programmatically identifiable name, regardless of whether it has a visible label or not, things like that. So one of the ways that you can test uh, this semantic structure of your HTML is by viewing the accessibility tree of the resulting UI. And my favorite way of doing that is also in Firefox, um, because when we're on this accessibility tab here in the dev tools, 
we can open this document tree here and we can keep we can keep drilling down into that tree to see different parts of the semantic structure of the HTML. This is similar to the DOM structure. I mean, the, the regular HTML structure that you've probably all seen in the browser's dev tools that looks like this. So it's a very, very similar type of tree structure. Oops, wrong tab, accessibility. It's a very similar type of tree structure, but instead of showing you the HTML, it's showing you the logical semantic uh, content. This is the kind of this is the model of the web page that is actually conveyed to assistive technologies like screen readers by the browser. So the screen reader typically doesn't see the HTML structure directly. Instead, it works with this accessibility tree model that the web browser provides it with. So for example, if we drill down here to uh, this content area here, uh, we'll see that there's an empty landmark element and there's a region called orders and there's another region called warehouse and a third region uh, over, well, it's a bit broken now because of the because of the layout, we can just reload that. That's a bit better. So we can, for example, drill down into one of those regions that we had uh, over here. So as you can see, the orders, warehouse, and factory columns in the UI, which hopefully you can identify as three distinct parts of the UI each with its own pie chart and each with its own uh, figures here at the bottom. Hopefully you can visually identify those three sets of content as columns. And as we can see here in the accessibility tree, orders is its own region followed by warehouse and factory. So the fact that you can see them here in the accessibility tree in the same logical structure as the way you perceive them visually is a good indication that your HTML structure is in a good shape. Another thing we could check here is, for example, here at the top, we have a button, the button for toggling the navigation column on the side. If we look at the button here, it's identified as a push button with the name menu toggle. And that's a good indication that it has a name menu toggle because Obviously, there's no visual, visible label called menu toggle here, but it still has, it's still identified as menu toggle in the accessibility tree. So what that tells us is that screen readers will be able to identify this element as a push button, which it is, and as a menu toggle, which is what it is. Now, we can also see down here in the properties, I can try to zoom in a bit here, to make that bigger. In the properties here, you'll see that the name is menu toggle. And we should also be able to see here some other um, accessibility related things like, like, I don't know, the states, for example, we can see whether it's, ex we can see whether it's expanded when it is expanded and so on. So this is a very useful way of, of checking that the semantics in your UI are in good shape. Uh, if we go to this text container here, which is the um, search field here at the top right, you'll see that it doesn't have a name. If you scroll down here to the properties, it has null for name. So that tells us that there's no way for a screen reader to be able to identify this as a search field and thus no way for the screen reader to be able to convey to the user that this is a search field. This is because it doesn't have a visible label or any other, for example, ARIA attribute that helps to identify it. I could show you a worse example. If we go to this UI instead, this is the exact same UI, but it's built, in, it's built with less accessibility in mind. So we can drill down here again to the main content section, which is here. And we can then try to find these same three columns, the order column, the warehouse column, and the factory column. And we'll notice here that 
we don't have those columns here. We have a region for each chart and we have text containers for all of these, all of these figures here at the bottom. And we'll have text containers for the titles here. But none of this is semantically identifiable as three sets of content. So this is a very good indication of a UI that will not be conveyed in a very good way by screen readers. There's a similar tool in Chrome. If you go to the web tools, uh, there's a button here, or you can enable a button here. I'm not sure if it's enabled by default, called Switch to Accessibility Tree View. And that shows you the same accessibility tree. If you don't have this button, I think you need to go to just, you know, just select some element with the DOM inspector instead. And you can go to uh, the accessibility tab for that selected element and click this, check this, enable full page accessibility tree checkbox. I'll just zoom in a bit with that. So you check that one and at least then you should have this accessibility tree toggle here. So, Again, by default, you'll see the HTML structure, but when you click this toggle here, you will instead see uh, this accessibility tree, which is similar to the one in Firefox, with the difference, though, that there are a lot of ignored and generic and generic and generic and ignored elements here in this tree, and that makes it a bit more difficult uh, to, to read, if you ask me. I think basically Chrome is, uh, gives a bit more detail on on the exact accessibility tree, whereas Firefox skips over elements that are ignored or generic, that don't have any semantic meaning. So the accessibility tree shows you the logical or semantic structure of the UI and the semantic roles and names of various elements. And that's good to know because that's how screen readers will essentially see the page. There's an old approach that I keep stumbling upon that I would not recommend, which is to disable the CSS on your web page. Uh, I think the idea of disabling the CSS comes from the fact that uh, you might have a lot of layouting that you do in CSS that change how the structure of the content is perceived. So by disabling CSS, the idea is that that will show you the true structure of your UI. That might work okay-ish for really simple web pages, but in practice for something like a complex web application UI that you would typically build with Bonin, that just doesn't work very well. Uh, it will be really difficult to get any under, any, any per, like proper picture of, of whether uh, your structure is in a good shape or not. So. The accessibility tree is vastly superior, in my opinion, to disabling CSS. Also, when you start testing the web page with a screen reader, you should definitely not disable CSS because the screen reader partially uses CSS uh, to understand the page. So having CSS on or off actually affects uh, the way that the screen reader understands the page. And since most users do have CSS on, even though they're using a screen reader, that will just give you an, an unrealistic picture of how the UI will work. So next up are automated testing tools. And I have an absolute favorite in that regard. Oh, let's open the dev tools again. Uh, and that is pretty much in my opinion, the gold standard for accessibility testing. It's uh, the, uh, let's see, why am I not seeing it here now? Oh, that's because I'm here. Okay. So the Axe Dev Tools. Axe is probably the most popular. Uh, automated accessibility to testing tool out there. It comes in a lot of different flavors. Uh, I'm using the Chrome extension. There's also an extension for Firefox, uh, probably for other browsers as well. And it is a very powerful tool, even the free version, which I have here currently. Uh, as you can see here, it's suggesting that I can get more, I can catch even more issues with the pro version. And well, there's some truth to that. Actually, I think the pro version is worth uh, the money. 
Yeah, I think it costs about $40 per month per user. And it does give you some useful features. Like for example, this scan part of my page is available with it. So instead of scanning the entire page every time, you can just scan a part of it. So in a UI like this, where you probably have navigation that is the same across all pages, and then you have uh, just the content of the uh, inside of the navigation, inside of the app layout that changes, you probably don't want to test the navigation over and over again. So because that will just give you those results that you might have for the navigation for every single page that you test. So that's a useful feature. There are also some other intelligent guided tests for keyboard functionality and modal dialogues and so on. The most useful reason or the most re useful feature in the pro version, in my opinion, is actually found in the settings where you can select the WCAG level. In this free version, that's locked to all. So like I described in part two, uh, like I mentioned above, um, there are three levels uh, of the WCAG standard. There's level A, which is the lowest level, like the bare minimum. There's level AA, which is what most accessibility laws in the US and EU, uh, or pretty much all of them in, in the US and the EU, and probably all of them in the rest of the world as well, are based on. And then there's level AAA, which is an even more strict level of, of WCAG. Now, if I had the pro version here, which I currently don't, uh, I would be able to select level AA, which is what I probably want to test against. So now when we can't change it, we're stuck with testing everything, including level AAA. But anyway, so you scan the page by clicking the scan my page button and you will get this toolbar at the top that will disappear after a while. And then you have the results here. So uh, the first thing you see here is this overview of the results. Uh, it found 87 issues in total and a breakdown here with you know, 52 issues that needs review. That actually means that these are issues that may not be issues at all, but instead um, X is telling you that it was unable to automatically determine whether something is an issue or not. So it's instructing you to test that manually. And then we have you know, five critical issues, zero serious ones, 30 moderate ones, and so on. So we can collapse this overview to get the actual issues. And they are listed by category like this. So we have, for example, the first one here is certain ARIA roles must be contained by particular parents. This is a good example of a finding that an automa automated accessibility testing tool would give you. And as you can see, um, it might not be that self-explanatory. You might need a bit of knowledge of WCAG and or of, of screen readers or so, or of ARIA in this case, uh, to understand what it's talking about. We can expand that one. And this four here means that it found four instances of this particular issue. And there are these navigation buttons here that allow you to go back and forth between those instances. One of the most useful tools here is the highlight. So that toggles on the highlight on the page that shows you where on the page that issue was found. And so when we traverse the instances here, you can see that highlight moving around. So it's highlighting an issue in the navigation. And this navigation is actually part of the experimental VCF nav component that is used in body start templates at the moment. It's experimental because it's a work in progress. It's not a final uh, complete uh, component yet. So, and one of the reasons for that is that there are some accessibility issues with it, like what X managed to identify here. So there's a description here of the issue, uh, ensures elements with an ARIA role that require parent roles are contained by them, which probably still doesn't tell you much about what to do about it or what the problem is. So there's this more info button here that you can click and that will take you to a page that describes this particular issue in more detail. So with a bit of luck with this description here, uh, you'll be able to figure out what the problem is. So the problem in this case is that we have, as we can see in this element source here, we have a VCF nav item HTML element that has the role 
list item. And the problem is that the list item role should only be used on elements that have a particular row uh, with, that have a parent element with a particular role that should be either list or group. And so because the parent element of VCF nav item doesn't have the list or group role, but the list item has the list item role, this is actually invalid ARIA. So Axe tells you about that. This does not necessarily mean that screen readers would not be able to parse this navigation column correctly. As you will see in a moment when I demonstrate how to use the voiceover screen reader, it does, it does you know, work just fine with voiceover and it does work well with NVDA and JAWS as well. But so it's an issue and you might want to look into it. We have some other uh, findings here as well. Uh, the next one is form elements must have labels. If we toggle on the highlight for that, it's highlighting the, the search field or rather the input element inside of the search field. Now, because you didn't provide this search field with a label, this is triggering an accessibility issue. This is actually a quite a severe accessibility issue because screen readers will have no chance of knowing that this is a a uh, search field, they will not be able to identify this icon here as a search icon. It's just an SVG element, so they will have no idea what this is. It's just an input field of type text, and that's all they know about it. So like I mentioned, there's also a bunch of, of issues uh, that are flagged as um, needs review, if we look at this overview here, these needs review issues are such that, well, they mostly have to do with color contrast. So Axe tries to uh, test the uh, color contrast of your text elements, uh, but because of various issues, it doesn't seem to be very doing a very good job of that. And so instead it flags every one of those as a uh, needs review type of issue. Uh, so they're here. And as you can see, the problem is, or the warning here is, elements must have sufficient color contrast. And what it's telling you is that this potential issue needs your review. It couldn't determine the background color of, in this case, the view title because of a pseudo element, which is a CSS feature that is used on the background of this header here. So you will get a lot of hits, in this case, 52 hits just for this single page, because it'll give you a hit for every instance of an element for which it's unable to determine the color contrast. So even though you get 52 or like, you know, what we got here in total, 87 issues, that doesn't mean that there are 87 things you need to fix. You know, likelihood, there's maybe like 30 issues or so that you need to fix, but X is uh, listing every single instance of those issues, even in cases like the navigation here, where the issue is not in these items, navigation items themselves, but rather in the parent element in which they are contained. So in summary, automated testing tools, uh, the recommended tool, in my opinion, is clearly the Axe browser, browser extension. Uh, you can find that through the Chrome Web Store, or the Firefox uh, uh, extension uh, store, or through dayq.com slash x. Um, there's also uh, an accessibility testing tool built into Chrome. Uh, if you go, I can actually show you that. If we close, oh, let me close the whole thing. If we go into Lighthouse here, the Lighthouse tab, there's an accessibility testing thing here. And you can try to analyze your accessibility with that. Uh, I have not found it to work very well, at least with Vaadin applications. So I wouldn't recommend trying that with Vaadin. And the most important thing to understand is even with a really good accessibility testing tool like Axe, you're not likely to catch more than about 50% of all issues in your UI. So even though you got 87 findings on that page, um, many of which were just repetitions of the same issue, there's in all likelihood still as many actual issues on that page that Axe was unable to find automatically. And so the only way to actually test 
the accessibility of a UI properly is to use a screen reader and test it manually. Also, these, there are some false alarms, and I put that in quotation marks because it's a bit incorrect to call them false alarms. Um, one thing that X typically complains about is, for example, that ID attributes are not unique. So that's correct. That's not a false alarm in that ID attributes technically should be unique. But for example, in body and icons that are built with SVG, uh, there's a bunch of ID attributes. So if you use the same icon multiple times on the same page, then there will be multiple SVG elements, like elements inside of the SVG of the icons that will have the same ID attribute. Now, that has absolutely zero effect on accessibility, but X will still complain about it. So you need to keep that in mind. And finally, understanding these findings that you get from X or pretty much any other accessibility testing tool is not always trivial. You still need to understand uh, the weak criteria that is based on or the ARIA attributes that are involved. So that brings us to testing with actual screen readers. Um, screen readers, and I'm going to just briefly recap from, from uh, last time, or was it part one? So screen readers are software utilities that use text-to-speech synthesis to read the UI out loud to users who are unable to see the UI. So they're used by blind people and by users with severe uh, vision impairments. Typically, not always, but typically, the user navigates the UI with a keyboard there are also mobile screen readers for, for iOS and Android uh, with which you can also use uh, a Bluetooth keyboard or you can use swipe gestures to navigate with them. But typically uh, on the desktop, most users use the keyboard with them. So in addition to just being able to tab from eat from one focusable element to another, as you do with, you know, regularly with a browser, when you use, for example, to fill in a form, use a tab key to jump between focusable elements. In addition to that, screen readers provide you with something known as a virtual cursor, which provides you with more advanced keyboard navigation across all page elements, not just the focusable ones. They also provide you with shortcuts to different relevant parts of the screen. For example, the navigation, the header, the footer, or the main content area. There's a lot of screen reader software out there, um, but luckily uh, there are three really big ones on the desktop that you can probably safely focus on, focus your testing on. On Windows, there are two big ones. JAWS, which has over, I think, at least according to some source I found, over half of the market share. And uh, then there's NVDA, uh, which has about a third of the market share in total. Then on Mac OS, there's uh, a utility called VoiceOver, which is built into Mac OS itself. So it's free. Uh, and by the way, NVDA is also free while, Mac, uh, while JAWS is a uh, uh, commercial uh, software. So, VoiceOver, because it's only a Mac, it has about 70% of the market share because Macs have a smaller market share. But it's still bigger than the Mac market share in general. And there's a bunch of other screen readers that make up roughly 8% of, of the market. On mobile, uh, VoiceOver actually has by far the most users. About 72% of mobile screen reader users use VoiceOver on iPhones or uh, iPads. And on Android, there's a corresponding utility uh, called TalkBack, which is built by Google. And is, I think it's probably shipped by default with most Android phones. So let's actually try using uh, a screen reader. And because I'm on a Mac here, I'm going to be using VoiceOver. And VoiceOver works much better on Safari then it works on Chrome or Firefox. It works fine on Chrome and, and Firefox, but at the very least, it tends to be overly verbose. And as you'll notice in a moment, if, if we manage to uh, convey the audio over the screen share, uh, 
voiceover is verbose enough already on Safari. Uh, you don't need that additional verbosity uh, with other browsers. In general, it also it's built to work with Safari and it just works better. So I would highly recommend it. The vast majority of voiceover users actually use it with Safari. So that's another good reason to, to pair it with that browser. That's actually another thing I wanted to point out that uh, you always use a screen reader in conjunction with a regular web browser. So people might use JAWS and a uh, NVDA with Chrome or Firefox or Edge with, on Windows. And people could use VoiceOver with any browser on Mac OS, but it's usually, um, it's usually uh, Safari. So to enable VoiceOver, you go into the system preferences on Mac OS and you click enable VoiceOver. And when I do that, it will immediately start talking. Um, you can you can make it quiet with the control key, luckily. And I'll, I'll be using that a lot. Otherwise, it will be talking over me constantly. Welcome to VoiceOver. VoiceOver speaks descriptions of items on the screen and can be used to control the computer using only your keyboard. VoiceOver on system preference Safari. Product dashboard window. Product dashboard web content has keyboard focus. So. I hope you could hear that. So that's what uh, voiceover sounds like. As you can see, there's also a speech bubble at the bottom of the screen that uh, conveys the same uh, content that is spoken uh, in, you know, with text. So um, voiceover has this um, keyboard shortcut known as the voiceover key or the VO key. So any documentation or any tutorial you'll read on voiceover talks about the VO key and any keyboard shortcuts you'll find tend to uh, talk about VO plus something. So by default, uh, the v voiceover uh, action key is, um, I think it's con um, option command. So it's, it's a combination of two modifier keys, uh, but you can modify that. And I've modified mine to be caps lock because I find that I'm not enough of a contortionist to press both uh, option and command and a bunch of other keys at the same time. So voiceover will actually tell me the exact uh, keyboard shortcut to use for various uh, functions. Uh, so it will say caps lock, but if you haven't configured that to be caps lock, it will just say, I think option and command instead. So we're now focused in the Safari viewport here. It tells us that we're in Safari on product dashboard, which is the title, not the view title, but the title of the web page itself that you would see in the tab as well. It's in a window and it says product dashboard again for some reason. And we are in web content and it has keyboard focus. So what we can do now is we can hold the voiceover key down and press arrow right. Product dashboard web content. Uh, we can do it again. Product dashboard oh, web content. I think I probably need to go down into it. Menu toggle, expanded button. You are currently on a button inside web content. To click this button, press caps lock space. To exit this web area, press caps lock shift up arrow. So yeah, it's basically telling, that, telling us that we're on a button. So to click the button, we don't just press um, space as we normally would. Instead, we're pressing caps lock space. So we're clicking the button via voiceover, which is a bit like clicking it with a virtual mouse, I guess. And as you can see, uh, that works just fine. Now, we're currently on a focusable element, but if we want to get to non-focusable content, which we need to be able to do uh, to get the whole content of this page, we use voiceover key and right arrow key. Heading level two product dashboard. You are currently on a heading level two inside web content. Okay, I'll use the control key here now to make it quiet. So as you can see for each element that we traverse, uh, voiceover will immediately uh, announce both the type of that element and the name of the element and some descriptions uh, usually also tell us what keyboard shortcut to use to interact with it. Edit text blank. You are currently on a text field inside web content to enter. Yeah. So here voiceover is telling us that we're on a text field and it's blank because it's an empty text field. 
and a voiceover has no idea what the, what this text field is because we haven't provided it with a label. So if I were blind now, I would not have any idea what this text field is about. Banner. You are currently on a banner. So a banner is basically a header element. And uh, next we'll drill down into the navigation column on the left. Heading level one, Acme ERP, end of banner navigation. You are currently on a navigation inside web content. List four items, visited link, products, one of four, link, customers, two of four, link, categories, link, admin, end of list, end of navigation, main. You are currently on a main. So this is where these uh, semantic landmark elements come into play that I uh, talked about in part two. So for example, navigation, the navigation uh, element is a landmark element and it's identified either by the role navigation ARIA attribute or by being implemented with a nav HTML element. Similarly, the main that I'm currently inside is either a main HTML element or any HTML element with the role main. And these are these these landmark areas are very important for screen reader users because will it allows the screen reader to for one thing tell us when we're inside of the navigation part of the UI and when we are in the actual content part of the main UI called main. What they also do is that they're listed in these uh, shortcut lists. So if you press caps lock and U landmarks menu. So that gives us a landmarks menu that lists all of the landmark elements on this page. So we have the header banner or banner navigation main. And also each of these three uh, columns of content, the orders, warehouse and factory columns orders region. And for some reason, each of these uh, voting charts is also its own region. In fact, for some reason, because of the way high charts is implemented, it's actually listed as two regions, and I'm not sure why that is. Charts, warehouse region, charts, factory region, and so on. So if you want to go to the factory region, we press enter here. You are currently in a region. And then we can start traversing that region. Heading level three, factory. Your chart, high charts, interactive chart, region. I'll just quickly show you what it's like to traverse a VODIN chart or a high charts chart. Uh, that is implemented with uh, with voiceover. It's very verbose, but I just want to give you an idea of what it's like. And the, I think the important takeaway here is that although it's excessively excessively verbose, the important thing is that you can actually read the values in that pie chart with the screen reader, as if it wasn't an image. Chart screen reader information chart chart pie chart with four slices. End of chart screen reader information one foo forty. Image interactive chart group two bar twenty five three baz fifteen four misc twenty image image end of interactive chart group end of interactive chart end of chart high charts interactive chart region description list inventory three items you are currently in a description list so now we're in a description list which is a particular type of HTML structure. And we can use, for example, the uh, voiceover A shortcut to have voiceover read the whole contents of this list for us. Description list inventory three items, widgets, 270, devices, 56, doodads, 123, product, one, foo, 40, image interactive. And it just continues. You can actually read the whole page from beginning to end with uh, voiceover and A. So in my case, caps lock and A. Um, so one of the things I want to point out here Interactive is, end of chart screen. Oh, I'm sorry. One of the things I want to point out here is that uh, just like we saw in the accessibility tree, uh, in, in this good ex better example, each of these three columns is identified as a region. I can take you now to do, to a worse implemented version of this page. Local host colony. Reload this page. Good XM. Lo log button. Product dashboard. Web content. You are currently on a button. Inside web content. Info button. Interact with the title of info, okay. product, okay. edit text, banner, heading, end of banner. You are so let's look at that shortcut list of landmarks. Landmarks menu. As you can see here, the orders, warehouse, and factory landmarks are absent. We don't have those columns here at all. 
eight items. We do, have, we do have the navigation landmark, but we don't have the main landmark, which uh, denotes the main content area of the view. So just because this um, view was built in a worse, with a worse structure than the previous one, uh, VoiceOver is unable to identify the main content area, and it's also unable to identify the orders, warehouse, and factory columns as discrete groups of content. And if we, for example, now go into... You are currently factory warehouse orders. You are currently on a text element go into, inside web content. Go into these columns here, we'll see that it will traverse first the orders, warehouse, factory titles, and then next it will traverse the uh, pie charts. And after that, it will traverse the uh, figures at the end as if they were not grouped into columns at all. So I'll just turn off voiceover now. System preference, voiceover off. And we can enjoy the silence again. So that was uh, all I had to show you. Um, as you probably saw, uh, it can be quite uh, overwhelming to use a screen reader for the first time. Uh, you do get used to it though. And the, the thing is that the better your UI is actually structured, the more semantic your structure is, and the better you've identified all of your interactive elements and so on, the more pleasant that experience will be, will be for you as well. And especially for the users who basically have no choice but to use a screen reader. So that was uh, the end of my content on, in this part. Uh, here on this slide here, you see tiny URL links to the two previous um, parts of this webinar series. Part one about legislation and standards is tinyurl.com slash a11y-now-1. And part two about how to build accessible web applications with Vaadin is tinyurl.com slash a11y-now-2. Um, you can reach me by email at rolf at vaadin.com or on Twitter at Rolf Smeds or on Discord. There's uh, the Vaadin Discord chat at at vod.in slash chat. You can regist register and uh, uh, log in there if you haven't done that already. And there's a dedicated channel for accessibility stuff called A11Y, where um, I and others interested in accessibility can, can help you with related things. So Kim, do we have any questions? We do have some questions. Thanks for that, Rolf. Um, so I'm going to go through a few of those and anybody else that has questions, feel free to go to that questions icon down on the lower right of your screen. Um, so I'm going to ask I'm a little bit out of order, but the one question was about in the accessibility tab. And I think this is when you were going through it in the browser and you were looking at the structure yeah. and it says there were lots of sections which had no name. How does this behave with a screen reader? Is it a problem? Um, not all sections need to have a name. Uh, so if they are not semantically meaningful in any way, uh, they don't necessarily need to have names. So let's say if you have a bunch of div, uh, like a, a bunch of divs nested inside each other, and the only reason you have that is to provide a particular type of layout, then, and it's not semantically meaningful in any way, then no, they don't need to have names. So, uh, if we look at the, if we look at the example UI that I, that I had here. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is important for these three columns here to have names. And those names are, of course, provided through those uh, heading, heading elements here. Um, but it's not important, for example, uh, well, I can't think of any particular example here right now, but let's say if we wanted to wrap these three, if we wanted to wrap these three columns into a parent wrapper and another parent wrapper around it, for example, just to provide, I don't know, borders or something around it, that's not something you need to have uh, a name for. So anything that is has semantic meaning, if you like, if you describe the UI to someone, think about if you would describe it to someone who can't see it, would you mention that element? If yes, then it should probably have a name. And it should also have an appropriate ARIA role or be built with uh, 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 a semantic HTML, HTML element like, like NAM, for example. 
All right, well, we had also a couple of questions kind of more related to the Vaden's Lumo theme. Yeah. And one question was when you were talking about, I believe it was, it might've been the combo box or it might've been the search box. Yeah. And you said, hey, right now we might add like an outline around it to make it more contrasting. Yeah. And somebody asked the question, why wouldn't you make the default theme accessible and instead you know, as opposed to, I think you were saying you were going to give an option for it. Yeah. Well, um, we do our best to make the default theme as accessible as possible, as long as we can do that without significantly altering the look and feel of existing applications. So that's something we unfortunately always have to balance between, uh, right. between, between, you know, because if we, if we now apply borders around all the input fields and the buttons, then everybody who uses those components will suddenly have borders around their, their inputs and buttons uh, in their applications. And of course, that might not be a problem per se if they're using the default Luma theme, but if they've customized that Luma theme, we might be overriding or somehow conflicting with those customizations. So we would love to make it access fully accessible by default. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that without breaking changes. So I'm not sure if this is going to be a separate Luma variant or just a property that you can toggle on or off, or it, it, we might do it that way. We might have a CSS property that is on by default and with a single line of CSS, you can turn it off. That might do it. So we're not sure exactly how we're going to be providing that, but we are going to be providing it in some form. And then this second question that's related to that might be related to that exact thing that somebody said, hey, we got an accessibility issue with color contrast in error notification with Lumo theme. Is this a known thing? Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> um, so please file a bug ticket about that or, or just ping me about it on, on Discord or by email. So... That would be that would be interesting to see what that is. I mean, now that you've mentioned it, we could just go ahead and test it. But it's even better if you can just point it point us to it. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rolf, for all of that. I know that I learned a lot about accessibility. I hope you all did too, and we hope to see you all on a future webinar. Thanks for listening.